Good afternoon. Following huge protests, the leader of Hong Kong has suspended plans to introduce a new law that would allow extraditions to mainland China. The proposals have prompted big demonstrations, including one last Sunday, where organisers said more than a million people took part. Our China correspondent Stephen McDonnell reports from Hong Kong, and a warning, the report contains some flashing images. The large demonstrations just days ago turned into running street battles with the police. It would prove to be the turning point in this standoff. The government of Hong Kong has been forced to concede that its controversial extradition bill has prompted ill will and division here. And the announcement came that it would be shelved, at least for the time being. I now announce that the government has decided to suspend the legislative amendment exercise. Restart our communication with all sectors of society. Do more explanation work and listen to different views of society. However, a vast array of opposition groups say the extradition bill means facing mainland Chinese courts controlled by the Communist Party, which can't guarantee a fair trial. And they say Carrie Lam ultimately still wants it introduced. Hong Kong people won't be cheated by the temporary suspension. Carrie Lam's comments will only make us more angry. The city enjoys freedoms which were guaranteed when the former British colony was handed back to China. A key pillar of those freedoms is having an independent judiciary. That's why for many people here the fight against extradition is a fight for everything this place stands for. And it's why they say they won't give up until the extradition proposal has gone forever. Protests planned for tomorrow will go ahead, with some calling for Carrie Lam to resign. The government the, uh, has not given up yet, so I think we still have to fight for what we want to do, because this is not the end yet. Delay of this bill may provide a truce for now, but with both sides digging in, this relief of pressure could also only be temporary. Stephen MacDonald, BBC News, Hong Kong. More homes are being evacuated following severe flooding in Lincolnshire. Residents in nearly 300 properties in Wainfleet will be moved over concerns over flood defences on the river Steeping. Well, the town flooded this week after two months' worth of rain fell in two days and the river burst its banks. The Environment Agency said water levels remain high. The exam board at Excel has launched an investigation into how part of an A-level maths paper was leaked online. Blacked out images of two questions were shared on social media ahead of the exam yesterday. Pearson, which runs Edexcel, said the images were circulated in a very limited way. It reassured students no one would be advantaged or disadvantaged and they would not have to resit the paper. Nazani Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British Iranian jailed in Iran, has begun a new hunger strike in protest against her imprisonment. Her husband, back in the UK, also plans to join her on hunger strike. The mother of one has been detained for the past three years after being accused of spying by the Iranian authorities, a charge she strongly denies. She's been sentenced to five years in jail. It comes at a time of high tension in the region. The US military released video footage yesterday, which it said proved Iran was behind Thursday's attacks on two oil tankers, something Iran has categorically denied. Well, the Foreign Secretary is in central London at a meeting of some of the Conservative leadership contenders. Our political correspondent, Nick Erdley, is there. Nick, the Foreign Secretary has been commenting. Yeah, Miss Ratcliffe's case has been at the heart of some of the tensions between the UK and Iran over the last few years. This morning, the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, was with her husband, Richard, and was tweeting a message to the regime saying, do the right thing, show the world your humanity, and let this innocent woman go home. So far, those messages from the UK government have fallen on deaf ears, however. And at the same time, there's a furious row going on at home over the role of the Iranian regime in those attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. The US has said it believes that Iran was responsible. The UK has said, too, that that's the way that evidence points. But last night, Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, said that he didn't think there had been enough evidence, and the Labour Party is calling for more of an assessment 
of what took place. That's prompted the Foreign Secretary to respond, calling Mr Corbyn pathetic and predictable. But it shows that even in the row with Iran, nothing is simple. Nick Erdley, thanks very much. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has ordered what he called a root and branch review of hospital food after two more patient deaths were linked to a listeria outbreak. A total of five people have now known to have been killed and production has been halted at the sandwiches and salads thought to have caused the outbreak. Lee Milner reports. Five people have now died after eating hospital sandwiches and salads containing listeria. Two lost their lives here at the Manchester Royal Infirmary, another at Aintree Hospital. It's not yet been revealed where the other two patients died, but Public Health England has confirmed that seven trusts across the country have been affected. The Food Standards Agency ourselves are trying to identify how this could have got into the, to the food chain. Um, that is going to take some time to do, but what we have done is um, taken steps to make sure that the product is no longer distributed and therefore the public and the NHS patients um, are safe. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has now called for a review of NHS food. In a statement, he said, I have been incredibly concerned by this issue and strongly believe that we need a radical new approach to the food that is served in our NHS. Listeria typically causes mild food poisoning, but can prove fatal if people are already seriously ill. The first patient affected showed symptoms on the 25th of April. Suspect salads and sandwiches were withdrawn on the 25th of May. Public Health England first warned about the outbreak on the 7th of June. The good food chain, which has been linked to the outbreak, has since voluntarily ceased production. As investigations continue, Public Health England insists any risk to the public remains low. Lee Milner, BBC News. The Italian film and opera director Franco Zeffirelli has died at the age of 96. The Anglophile, who is perhaps best known for his adaptations of Shakespeare's works, including Romeo and Juliet, is reported to have died peacefully after a long illness. With all the sport now, here's Mike Bushell at the BBC Sports Centre. Mike. Yes, good afternoon, Geeta. Thank you. England's women are already looking forward to the knockout phase of the World Cup, having qualified from the group score against Sri Lanka. But that's all the sport for now, Geeta. Mike, thanks very much. You can see more of all today's stories on the BBC News Channel and the next news on BBC One is at 20 to 7. Bye for now. Hello, you're watching the BBC News Channel with Geetha Guramuthi. It is now 11 minutes past one. More now on news that a comprehensive review of hospital food has been ordered by the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, in response to the deaths of five patients who contracted listeria. Well, seven NHS trusts have been affected by the outbreak, which has been linked to pre-packed sandwiches and salads. Public Health England said the wider risk to the public remains low. A little earlier, I spoke to Dr Nick Finn, Deputy Director of the National Infection Service at Public Health England. We've detected nine people that we can link to this incident, and that um, covers um, seven trusts. And do you know exactly how this infection has originated? What do you know, whether it's about the responsibility of the company or the hospitals? In Public Health England, our role is really around detecting and in advising and managing incidents and outbreaks. So we've got a fairly advanced technique called whole genome sequencing, which is almost like genetic fingerprinting. And we detected three patients with identical strains of listeria, saying that therefore they had to be linked. And as we started to accumulate that evidence and gather the you know, the histories of what they'd eaten all pointed to one particular company. We then had samples um, taken from that company and were able to link the some of the products with um, the patients, therefore um, giving a very good link um, to, and identifying the cause of the incident. So we're fairly confident that now we've identified it and working with the FSA and local authorities, steps have been taken to stop production and um, that this um, issue is, is, is no longer. And can you tell us what the food stuff is and how it's become contaminated or infected? 
Well, these are products that were used um, in, as part of the sandwiches. Um, at the moment, both the, um, the Food Standards Agency and ourselves are trying to identify how this could have got into the, to the food chain. Um, that is going to take some time to do. But what we have done is um, taken steps to make sure that the product is no longer distributed and therefore the public and the NHS patients um, are safe. So you, what you're saying is, as I understand it, that this was the responsibility at source of the production of the sandwiches, not in terms of how they were handled subsequently? Well, everything points to the fact that there was some form of contamination in the product used by the company. Um, and, you know, that is obviously something we're investigating further with the FSA and with the local authorities. In, in terms of the, the message to the public now, people who are in hospital, who've got family in hospital and are worried about eating the food that they're being served, can the public be sure that it's safe? Well, it, it's as safe as it can be because we very quickly identified this and on 25th of May, the products were withdrawn um, and we've now been running for over two weeks and we've not seen any new cases since then. So that's very encouraging. One of the things we have to be aware of though is that the stereosis has got uh, the stereo has a long incubation period, but we would have expected most cases to have been affected and um, to have appeared by now. Um, and all I can say is that having taken the product off the, the market, um, people can have confidence, certainly, um, that there is no longer a risk from, from that source. And I know that you're being careful at the moment not to identify the exact location of these outbreaks, but can you give us a, a, a rough area, a region where these cases have appeared? Well, these cases have been across England um, and, um, you know, they've mapped the distribution of the sandwiches that were provided. Dr Nick Finn there from Public Health England speaking to me earlier. Two teenagers have been killed in London in separate attacks within minutes of each other. Police are investigating after one was stabbed in Wandsworth shortly before five o'clock yesterday afternoon and another was shot in Plumstead. Police have made arrests in connection with each death. A huge cannabis factory has been discovered inside a disused bingo hall in Kettering. Police raided the building in the centre of the town and found around 2,000 plants and a sophisticated hydroponic system to water the plants. They said the uh, factory could produce drugs with a street value of nearly £2 million a year. What has surprised me is just how criminally audacious this particular setup has been. It's in the middle of a town centre location. Um, you know, normally you get these in like industrial type warehouses and like other more isolated locations. But uh, yeah, this is quite a sophisticated setup. As we've been hearing, the Italian film and opera director Franco Zeffirelli has died at the age of 96. In a career which spanned over 60 years, some of his best known works included The Taming of the Shrew, starring Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, and Hamlet with Mel Gibson and Glenn Close. Lisa Mazimba looks back at his life. <laughs> Franco Zeffirelli made his name as an opera director, on stage and occasionally on screen. Opera taught him how to deal with highly strung and highly talented performers. It is as simple as that, holding their hands, really dealing with very vulnerable people, very charming little kids that they can't believe the luck and they, they they are afraid. Without a Petruchio to be thy lawful wedded husband. His experience proved useful when he made a film with a famously temperamental couple, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. I will marry A sweet propose and rest come to thy heart, as that within my breast. His film version of Romeo and Juliet was nominated for an Oscar, but was controversial. Huh? Olivia Hussey, then just 15, appeared topless. Zeffirelli, who'd started out as a stage and screen designer, was sometimes attacked for self-indulgence and for sentimentality. 
But Jesus of Nazareth, made for television, showed a different and more austere side to his work. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would have fought to prevent me from being captured. In 2004, he was given an honorary knighthood. He'd always been an Anglophile. To think about England in terms of uh, the country that I would like to see married with my country, Italy. And they managed, you know, in a way or the other, to make this marriage happen with my work and my association with the British talent. And such a traditional honour meant a lot to a director renowned for his love of formality, opulence and beauty. The Mazimba there on the life of Franco Zeffirelli, who's died at the age of 96. People from black, Asian and other minority ethnic communities are more at risk of developing some cancers and other life-limiting illnesses such as kidney failure and type 2 diabetes. They're also less likely to access or be offered hospice care services and now a new government-funded study aims to increase take-up rates across England. Our community affairs correspondent Adina Campbell can explain. Now, are you comfortable? <laughs> Now, Retired businessman Dalbar Singh was diagnosed with stage 4 lymphoma two and a half years ago. Part of his health care plan includes coming here to his local hospice in Luton, a service he and many others wouldn't normally consider. The concept of the Asian community have of hospice is a place you go to die. I didn't want to come here. There was a certain nurse at the health centre, she said, just try it, Alba, and then, then come and tell me. And I'm so grateful that I came, and it's made my life a lot more comfortable. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks very much. A new two-and-a-half-year study, the first of its kind in the UK, will now look at the improvements needed to encourage more people from Asian, black and other minority groups access this type of care, using more than £400,000 of government funding. There's been quite a lot of... Um, relatively quite a lot of research about establishing that people from minority ethnic communities are disadvantaged in the end of life. There's not a lot about what those disadvantages look like in terms of um, uh, health outcomes. There are many reasons for a low take-up of hospice care services by these communities, including cultural, language and religious differences and often families take on the full responsibility of care themselves. But some doctors are also unlikely to recommend this kind of support in the first place because of a lack of understanding or fear they may cause offence. The UK is set to become one of the world's most ethnically diverse countries over the next 30 years or so. Take Leicester, for example, and this busy cosmopolitan high street. We hear all the time about the pressures of an ageing population, but there's also an increasing need to ensure our care services also reflect and serve a wide range of cultural groups. These women in Birmingham were brought together through a hospice service which cared for them and their children before they died. I didn't know what hospice was, I didn't have understanding because I had a child before who passed away whose life was mostly spent in children's hospital. The quality of life of one individual is so important to embrace that we need to look at community resources. We learn a lot and now we try to give other people information. The results of the new study will be published in 2021. Researchers say it will help develop real change for ethnic minority groups all over the UK, with specialist training for those working in our care services. Adina Campbell, BBC News. Now, slightly happier news if you're from the Indian subcontinent because tens of thousands of cricket fans are converging on Manchester this weekend as India take on Pakistan in the World Cup. Both sides have large British fan bases and there were half a million ticket applications for the match, meaning Old Trafford, which has a capacity of 25,000, could have sold out 20 times over. Well, the game is expected to attract a worldwide audience of over half a billion making it one of the biggest sporting events of the year. Sukhanda Kamani has been speaking to some of the many Pakistanis who will be watching the game. There were cheers as Pakistan took on Australia earlier this week. 
But the night ended in disappointment for these fans in Islamabad as their team narrowly lost. The passion inspired by matches against India, though, is on another level. Is it a big deal to beat India? It's a pretty big deal, and not just because it's India versus Pakistan, not because of, but because, you know, like Real Madrid versus Barcelona, it's, you know, sport rivalry too. So that makes it very exciting as well. Sunday's game will be the first between the neighbours since a conflict in February that saw Pakistan shoot down and capture an Indian pilot. Toss jeet gaye to kya karoge? I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to tell you that, sir. This advert, spoofing his interrogation video, in which he politely refused to answer questions while sipping tea, has attracted both laughs and some criticism. You can leave now. Okay, sir. One second, go. Where are you going to take For most fans, though, cricket is a rare opportunity to unite the two nations. I think we're primarily, we have the same culture and I think cricket can be used as a bridge between the two countries for peace and for stability throughout the subcontinent. And yeah, so I think irrespective of who wins, at the end of the day, a good game and peace is what matters most. Pakistan-India games have at times produced some of cricket's greatest moments. Players know tens of millions will be watching. There is a massive amount of pressure, and now that the Indian Pak uh, India Pakistan games don't happen so frequently, there's more pressure. I feel someone who's in good form would probably be looking forward to doing well against India because if you do well against India, you could be a hero overnight. Come Sunday, grounds like this will be deserted, but because of tensions between the two countries, it's been years since Pakistan and India have been able to play against each other in front of a home crowd. Cricket fans will hope that can change someday soon. Sikandar Kamani, BBC News, Islamabad. Well, let's hope that match is not going to be rained off. Philip Avery is the man who can tell us what the weather's doing this weekend. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Guy. So no pressure. If you think India and Pakistan are under pressure, try being a weatherman after the June that we've had thus far. Uh, cereals are ripening behind me. Goodness knows how. Uh, there's still some rain in the forecast, not with the sort of intensity that we've seen, but it's probably going to be fairly unwelcome given it's the weekend. Uh, there is some sunshine in the forecast as well. The mix delivered by this big area of low pressure. Get used to it because uh, even as we take a look at the week ahead, that low pressure is still very much the dominant feature for the next few days or so. Uh, and so, pretty leaden skies in some locations. This was quite a way east, uh, London, in fact, earlier on today. Uh, and that was quite a way away from the main weather action of the morning, which was to be found further towards the west. A lot of rain, in fact, across the eastern half of Northern Ireland through the western side of Scotland. Then a rain band gradually working its way, showery bursts rather than anything else, ever further towards the east. So if you've had a dry day thus far, I think at some point, east of the Pennines, east Anglia, the southeast, you will get to see some rain. Then it clears overnight, say, for the northern parts of Scotland, and then a southern portion of that weather front returns into the southwest and into Wales to start the new day. Again, showery burst, not a particularly cold start to the new day, but that's the setup. So this time the pressure chart showing the low pressure out towards the west. That's the unsettled driver of our weather. And the showers just being enhanced every so often as these little bands of weather uh, work their way around the southern and eastern flanks of that low pressure. So not bad to start the day. The showers largely confined to this southwestern quarter and again uh, close to that low pressure for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Through the course of the day, though, those showers will drift ever further towards the north and east. A noticeable breeze urging the showers along further to the north and east. Top temperature on the day on a par with today, around about 20 degrees or so. And guess what? Here we are as far ahead as Monday, and it's still close to that area of low pressure out towards the west of the British Isles. It's Scotland, Northern Ireland, seeing the bulk of the weather. To the south, a fair amount of cloud, but where it breaks and the breeze is coming from the south and southwest, I think you will feel a degree more or two on the temperatures, a little bit more warmth there as the sunshine comes on through. And we continue that trend across the southeastern quarter to see the temperatures maxing, we think, somewhere around about Tuesday, Wednesday, at around 24, possibly even a 20. But I think further to the north and west, still close to that area of low pressure, that's where we're going to see the bulk of the hefty showers. No real signs of summer just yet, although Tuesday, not bad for the time of year. See you later.